As we uh, come to our time in God's Word together today, we're going to be looking at part two of the message I started last week on the subject of church discipline. Big subject. Um, This is part of the series on our core values here at Community Bible Church, which are the 12 biblical guiding principles and practices designed to bring clarity to how we specifically function as a local church. These core values help to describe how we carry out our vision and our mission as a church. And as I always say, if you want more information on that, you can find it on our website. Also, what we believe and teach, communitybiblechurch.org.nz. And we have some membership booklets in the foyer also. You may find that helpful if you've been perhaps coming along for a while and you want to find out more about becoming a member here at CBC. So the core values are divided into four main categories covering how our church is governed, how we seek to grow as believers, how we gather in worship together, and also how we go into the world bringing the gospel to the lost. Under the heading of how we seek to govern biblically, so far we've already covered biblically qualified leadership and meaningful church membership. And last week we began to look at the third core value, which is titled the practice of loving and patient church discipline. And I soon realized we'd need more than one week on this complex and at times controversial subject. So that's why this ended up being a two-part message. So going forward, I'll be teaching these messages on our core values at various points in between our study through the book of Acts um, and other teachings until we've covered all 12. So let's pray and we'll come to God's word together. Father, thank you for the provision of your word. Thank you for the blessing of your word. And Lord, we thank you that You are here amongst us. Father, this time is set apart like no other time. You've set apart this time, Lord. You've called us together to worship you, to hear from your word. And we pray you give us hearts to hear, hearts to respond in a way that glorifies you. In Jesus' name, amen. As I said last week, just the mention of the phrase church discipline can cause some people to get palpitations. And this is mainly because of each person's own experience or understanding of what church discipline is all about. And as we're hopefully seeing in this study so far, the practice of church discipline is something that anyone seeking a new church should want to see as an essential practice of that church. But more often than not, It simply isn't practiced or at least understood by many churches and many Christians. So it means it's really important to know what we mean and what we don't mean when we use this term church discipline. So I'll give an overview of what we've covered and what we will be covering in today's message. And then I'll touch on some of the key points by way of recap, because it's really important for us to know what has led up to the place that we'll be starting from in today's message. So that's why these outlines are longer, because there's points from last week. But even with a recap, if you want to get a fuller picture, I'd encourage you, if you didn't hear last week, to listen to part one, because this requires explanation and understanding. So firstly, we looked at a biblical definition of church discipline, the what. I'll read that again shortly. Then we looked at some factors that create misunderstanding about church discipline. Following this, we considered the when of church discipline, and this led to the how of church discipline. We saw that the practice of church discipline is accomplished through both informal and more formal measures. And so last week we covered the how of the informal measures of church discipline and the first two stages of the formal measures. This morning we'll look at the how of stage three and after that we'll cover the why of church discipline. We'll look at hindrances to the effectiveness of church discipline and to finish off we'll look at some of the consequences of not carrying out church discipline. So I will recap um, from last week and we'll start with the biblical definition which helps us to understand the what. So this is a biblical definition of church discipline and it's in the outlines there. Church discipline is the process whereby members of the local church work together with the leadership of that church prayerfully and carefully to lovingly and patiently confront and call to repentance a fellow brother or sister who is willfully committing sin, yet remains unrepentant, rejecting all correction. 
It begins with informal private conversation, but if no repentance occurs, leads to wider church member and leadership involvement, and ultimately, as a last resort, results in excommunication of the unrepentant member as a stewardship of Christ's authority given to the church. Throughout every stage of this process, the goal and intent of these actions is the restoration of the unrepentant member and the protection and care of the other members of the church. So obviously quite a, a broad definition, purposefully, to, to cover many of the uh, angles. Because there is so much misunderstanding, the next thing we looked at was factors that create misunderstanding about church discipline. There were just two main ones we looked at. They were biblically uninformed church members. This is mainly because of the subject not being taught in churches and or believers not studying it for themselves, resulting in misunderstanding through a lack of knowledge. Churches make a huge mistake by seeking to practice church discipline when they haven't instructed their members from scripture about the purpose of church discipline. The second factor we looked at that often creates misunderstanding about church discipline was bad experiences. And this was referring to some of the unbiblical ways that certain churches have carried out church discipline, which then negatively shape a person's thinking about it. There are times this is used as an excuse when a member being disciplined is just refusing to repent, resisting correction, but there are also legitimate bad experiences people have that we need to take into consideration. The next area we looked at was the when of church discipline. And as stated in part one, it's critical to understand that the formal measures of church discipline are only ever required when the informal measures have failed to bring about any repentance in the life of the church member in sin. We talked about the importance of having a culture within a church where believers take responsibility for one another and are willing to bring correction lovingly and patiently when it's needed. It's not something just left to leaders. And also that we're all willing to receive correction from others too. So ideally, this can take place behind the scenes of church life, as it were. And when it does, it takes care of so many issues before they escalate or get more complex and difficult to deal with. Please turn in your Bibles to Matthew 18. <clears throat> We're continuing to recap. And this passage, verses 15 to 20, is one of the key passages that we began to look at last week where we gain a biblical understanding of church discipline. Matthew 18. And so with regard to the when of the informal measures of church discipline, we said this, when one church member sins against another church member or members and is either unaware, which is, I don't know, I didn't know, or unrepentant, which is, I don't care, of that sin, that is when the informal measures are to take place. And again, this can happen behind the scenes, this can happen over coffee, member to member, it can be a very, um, Smooth process, simple process, hopefully. And this is from Matthew 18, 15, and 1 Corinthians 5, we'll look at shortly. So Matthew 18, 15, it says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. If you remember, I also made the point that it doesn't mean it's always wrong to speak to others about that person if... That is for the purpose of seeking counsel and wisdom or even another perspective. We talked about tricky dynamics such as between a husband and a wife. And of course, the wife should be able to go and speak to someone. <clears throat> now, 1 Corinthians 5, another passage we'll, we'll be looking at. I'll just read verses 1 and 2 from that. And this is the trigger of unrepentant sin that should have enacted church discipline. But in this case, the church failed to act. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 to 2 says, It is actually reported there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife. And you are puffed up, and you've not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. So in these situations, loving correction should be brought, 
But when a church member refuses to repent or says they've repented, but the fruits of repentance are obviously not there, that is when the more formal measures need to be taken. All the while, with the goal being the restoration of the unrepentant member. Now, in the first part of Matthew 18, 16, we see the trigger for these formal measures with the words, but if he will not hear. So the when of the more formal measures is at that point, and we've described this as when a church member resists the informal measures of correction and remains unrepentant of a past sin and or willfully continues in that sin, that's when the formal measures are enacted in Matthew 18, 16. Because it may be a, a present ongoing sin. It may be something that happened three years ago, but it was, it was a sin that was covered up and needs to be addressed and repented of. And this leads to what we described as stage one of the formal church discipline process, which gives us an answer to the how of church discipline. How are the formal measures carried out, practically speaking? Jesus answers that in the rest of verse 16 of Matthew 18. Take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Now, depending on the situation, this stage could also be carried out more informally. And it should be, if possible. But that's only at times. The reality is, once you get to the point of confronting someone a second time with others, the tensions are going to rise. This is, of course, even more reason to be very careful about how this next stage is carried out. The purpose here is to have some evidence of the sin, hopefully, or at least of the response of the one in sin. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the sin itself had to be witnessed. It just means the conversation is and can be dealt with appropriately and lovingly. And the challenge with this, of course, is that in virtually all cases of church discipline, the one you are loving is not going to think you are loving them. Certainly not while they choose to remain unrepentant. But further down the track, Lord willing, they may realise you loved them more than the others who condoned or ignored what they were doing. Another challenge is that there is no one-size-fits-all approach with these things. Very important to understand. Within the two main passages, Matthew 18, 1 Corinthians 5, though there is a sense of an outline and there is a definite progression that we need to understand from Scripture, there is no way you can apply a clinical step-by-step -step process to church discipline because it's going to look very different in every situation. There has to be a lot of flexibility. You must go through these stages, but how that looks, the timing and the dynamics is incredibly different in every situation. And this just confirms it will virtually always be a messy and very difficult process to walk through. Variables to do with timing, the severity and nature of the sin, how many people are involved, how long it's been going on for, all these factors that need to be weighed up and considered. And so the first way we answered the how of the more formal measures of church discipline, which we call stage one, was take two or three other church members or leaders and lovingly and patiently confront and correct that member, calling them to repentance. And all of those words are important. Lovingly, patiently, confront, correct, call to repentance. Ideally, this will result in that person's repentance. The resistance given at first one-on-one, -on -one, hopefully, as there's others who love and care for this person, brings them to the point of realizing, what am I thinking? This is obviously a blind spot. And there's a repentance that results, not just in word, but in deed, very important. But if they still remain resistant to correction and unrepentance, or an unrepentant, things need to proceed to stage two. And this is what Jesus speaks about from verse 17 of Matthew 18. And if he refuses to hear them, so that's the trigger for stage two, tell it to the church. So this is when the leadership, if they didn't know already, and also the whole church are informed about the member in unrepentant sin. And at this point in the process, it is so vital that the whole church is united and on board with what is happening. It's very difficult to attain that, but it is vital. Ideally, because there have been witnesses, the unrepentant sin should be clearly established and not just hearsay. And then the most loving and biblical thing those church members can do is to fulfill 
their responsibility to reach out to the unrepentant member in love and plead with them to repent. It is all arms of the church reaching out in love. It is not just some voice from the front. And so in answer to the how of stage two, we said this, bring the matter to the leadership of the church, allowing them to decide when and how to communicate to the church about the member in sin, as they encourage the church family to reach out and lovingly call that member to repentance. Matthew 18, 17. Now, if that stage does lead to repentance, it is appropriate to publicly restore that believer into fellowship as being restored, as being forgiven, and urge the church family to embrace them and love them. Because sometimes they may struggle with that, but it's important that they're exhorted to embrace the person who has clearly been shown to be repentant. But if there is still no repentance, and again, taking a case-by-case -case approach with much wisdom, once it has been determined, depending on the extent of the sin, that enough church members have borne witness to a continued resistance and a lack of repentance, a characteristic unrepentance, then things must progress to stage three. And that's where this morning's message really begins. But I think it's been good for us to have refreshed ourselves in the stages that lead up to this point so we can see clearly the practice of church discipline in most cases should be very gradual and progressive. So let's read the, re sorry, the rest of verse 17 of Matthew 18. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Last week I finished by giving you all some homework, if you remember. I asked you to have a think about what it means to treat someone like a heathen and a tax collector. And I'm going to go around now and ask everybody... No, I'm not really. <laughs> Sadly, some interpret this to mean you shun them, reject them, ignore them. If you saw them walking down the street, you would cross to the other side and turn your head. But that's not what it means at all. What is our response as church members to be towards heathens, and tax collectors. It is to lovingly reach out to them with the gospel in the hope that they might be saved. Now that sits well with us when we talk about the heathens and the tax collectors out there, but there's a tricky dynamic here. We're talking about that treatment towards someone who was a professing member in our church. If a professing believer and a member of the local church, local church gets to this point in a church discipline process, then it is right and reasonable to doubt the genuineness of their conversion. That's the conclusion that this process is to bring you towards. You therefore must not be a believer because you are resisting every means by which God has given to point out that which is harming you and harming others. If they're a false convert, what do they need more than anything else? The gospel. If they're a genuine believer, what is the only hope for them at this point? The gospel. Now at this stage, if the member remains unrepentant, this does, in conjunction with what we'll read shortly in 1 Corinthians 5, require formal excommunication. Another word that has to be described, meaning essentially the member is put out of the church and no longer considered a member. But when I say those words, put out of the church, in some of your minds you have that picture you see in some movie where somebody's stayed too long at the pub and you see the window or the doors, the doors open, they whoosh, boom, and there they are, and they're sent on their way. That's not what excommunication is. But this is what happens eventually as a last resort and after many attempts to bring correction lovingly and patiently, in most cases, and I'll, I'll explain that later. <clears throat> now, it will look different in every situation. It doesn't necessarily mean the former member can't attend church. Depends on the situation. But they wouldn't be permitted to take communion as they're formally under discipline and now considered to be an unbeliever in need of the gospel. Just the dynamics of church discipline 
the person's not even going to be around in many cases. And again, this is where the most difficult thing about this stage, the critical stage, is having the whole church on board. Very difficult. And this is because there are certain things that believers find it hard to do, understandably. For example, it would not be right to eat with such a person who has got to this stage, or to treat them as you would other believers in good standing. Now, we don't have time to go into all the dynamics, but again, there are so many nuances to this. In a family context, if this was between a husband and a wife, that would not apply because the duties of a husband to his wife would override that. It would relate to the conduct within the church. But for other believers, towards that wife or that husband, it would mean that in their own homes, that they would not be able to welcome them for fellowship with other believers in good standing. doesn't mean they wouldn't be able to welcome into their home, but they wouldn't be able to bring them in in fellowship as if things are okay, acknowledging even silently that they are a, a believer in good standing. And this is very difficult to carry out. But the whole point is so the person is brought to their senses, in a sense, and repents. Now, if they are repentant, initially, verbally, and again, some sins, you'd have to verbalize it. Some sins, there'd be something you'd have to do initially or break off. But until that repentance is verified by the congregation, their own church should be the safest place for them to be. And depending on the situation, this verification of their repentance may be weeks or it may be a year or more. In fact, several years ago, I was in a church in the States and there was a great example of this. There was a, a young man in that church who'd formerly been married and this was a, a, a very serious situation of prolonged sexual immorality that led to the breakup of that marriage. He'd been formally disciplined by the church. He was repentant, but under discipline. In other words, due to the nature of what had happened, there was no way that they could verify his repentance in a matter of weeks. This was months and months and months. It was very serious. But I bring this up because this was months down the line where the member was under discipline. They were not partaking in the Lord's Supper. And even as I say that, I wonder if your picture of what it looks like matches my picture. Because what that picture looked like was this young man after church talking with families, holding children, being, exchanging conversations, smiling, laughing, talking with people. But when you spoke to this person, there was just uh, an obvious humility that rested upon them. But it wasn't condemnation. It was the safest place for them to be. And they welcomed this process because they knew that they needed to prove that there, there'd been a difference over time. Turn to 1 Corinthians 5 because we're going to read this whole chapter because <clears throat> this is a situation where there's been adultery but the church had not addressed it. So this is another key passage. Now you can see with this subject why we could have done 10 sermons and still not covered everything, but... However, not, not a single one of you emailed me a question, so that's your fault if you have any. I gave you the opportunity. I probably should check my junk mail. 1 Corinthians 5, the whole chapter. It is actually reported there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For indeed, as absent in body, but present in spirit, I indeed, sorry, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I were present, him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Clearly talking about a believer there. 
Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven, leaven is the whole lump, therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people, yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or idolaters. Since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone, here's the key, named a brother who is sexually immoral, or covetous, or an idolater, or a viler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. And that list is not a list that implies, oh, I'm okay, my sin is not on that list. A point is being made, not even to eat with such a person. And remember, in the biblical context, eating was not only I walk past the street having an ice cream, they have one too, I've sinned. Eating spoke of communion, communion in a sense. Not just Lord's Supper, but communion among believers, community among believers. For what have I, verse 12, to do with judging those who are outside? <clears throat> do you not judge those who are inside? Again, a verification that the church must deal with these things. But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. They're pretty strong words, aren't they? But it's all for the purpose of bringing the unrepentant sinner to repentance and restoration and to protect the purity of the church from the corruption of sin. Hold in your mind the weight, the severity, the seriousness of those words, of what was happening in that church at that time. Because we'll come back to that. Now with regard to excommunication, you can see hopefully, why church membership is so important. Because unless a person is committed to that church family, unless a person has identifiable leadership in their life who are accountable to God for their spiritual care, you can see how the whole process falls flat on its face. And even walking through these stages, you see how important it would be to address a church family, members who are known to one another, it wouldn't be appropriate to just stand up on a Sunday, talk about the details of the person who's in sin when you've had to bring it to the church. Somebody might be visiting that morning, they haven't got any history or context. You see how inappropriate it would be? You would need a time to address members who know that people, who know the process, who know the context. And this is why it's good for churches to work together too, making it harder for people to run with their sin to the refuge of another church who have no knowledge of the situation, which can be disastrous. I'll never forget an example I saw of how churches did work well together in a case of church discipline about 22 or 23 years ago when we were serving in a church on the North Shore here in Auckland before we moved down to Christchurch. We were just getting ready for an evening service and a local pastor called the pastor of the church that we were part of and, and basically brought him up to speed that there was a person in his church who had left his wife and gone into a relationship with his adopted daughter. It was an orphan that they brought in. And he'd left his wife and he was unrepentant. They'd walked through the stages of church discipline. And his wife and his children were obviously devastated. But he had knowledge that this man was attempting to turn up at the evening service and worship in a different church as if everything was okay. So um, we begin the service. Worship starts. In comes this, we, we knew who the person was. In comes this man with his adopted daughter, who was older. Everyone else would have thought they were a couple, holding hands, worshipping, hands raised. And as the worship concluded and the pastor opened the service, he began by saying the man's name and asking him to leave. The man jumped up, obviously, immediately, you know, totally embarrassed and stormed out with the woman. You, you don't forget those kind of church services. And then the pastor proceeded to explain to the congregation that man was here with his adopted daughter who he's in a sexual relationship with, having left his wife and family. And of course, everybody realised, OK. That they're not the kind of services you think, now everyone's really going to concentrate on my sermon after that point. But that was an example where the churches worked together for the good of the unrepentant sinner, 
and the purity of the church. What was a blessing to discover was that I actually ended up talking to a pastor up here only a year or so ago, having not really spoken about that incident for over 20 years, who ended up being the pastor who made the phone call to the pastor in our church. And he talked more about the situation. And I was so encouraged to hear that sometime after this happened, the father did eventually repent and remained repentant. Sadly, the marriage was never restored. So it wasn't the best outcome. But because people were willing to do the difficult, uncomfortable things that nobody really wanted to do, the outcome was much better than it would have been otherwise. So in answer to the how of stage three of formal church discipline, we can say this, and this is in the outlines, by collectively making it known to the member in sin that they can no longer be treated as a genuine believer due to their unrepentant stance, that their only hope is in the gospel, that they can no longer enjoy fellowship with other believers, and at the appropriate time, that member must be excommunicated from the church. And I hope it's been made clear <clears throat> that this is a last resort. But even then, there is still the hope of restoration if repentance occurs. Another story I heard a couple of years ago from a pastor when I was in the States of a church that he was a part of, there was a situation where there was adultery, a man had committed adultery against his wife, the church had sought to bring correction, he'd resisted, 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 remained in this relationship, remained unrepentant, so he was eventually excommunicated and it's been months and months gone by. And it was Thanksgiving in America. The pastor was having a, a Thanksgiving uh, meal with a whole lot of people around. And a little while after they got started, there was a knock at the door and he went out and he saw there was this man looking very bedraggled, just nothing like he, he looked before, the weight of everything upon his shoulders, the shame. But he said, is there any chance I can, I, I need somewhere for the night to stay. So the pastor said, well, you, you can come in, come in. He took him down to the basement. Now, th this is not America. Basement doesn't mean dungeon. Um, different part of the house, like a, a den. He took him down to the basement. He said, I, I can't allow you to come up and, and fellowship with us, but you can sleep down here. There's, there's a bed and I'll bring you a plate of food. So he went up and he brought the man down a plate of food. And the man was... Um, sitting there and then something happened with the electricity in that part of the house and the lights went out. And he was sitting there in the darkness and through the ceiling he could hear the laughter and the joy and the fellowship of brothers and sisters and what he had thrown away and he broke. And it was that very moment that brought him to repentance. But can you see how that would have been hindered if the church was not on board collectively? If he could find refuge with other people saying, oh, it's not that bad. The church carried it out properly and he was restored. Now, another point that's important to make here is that sometimes swifter action is required because of a divisive person. Can be other situations, but sometimes swifter action is required because of a divisive person. There are times when it's permissible to bypass a longer process of church discipline. There is, there is not just a license that someone has to say that they can cause a whole load of trauma in a church and just carry on until, oh, you've got to go through all the stages. I've got some time to cause destruction, not at all. There are a couple of verses that speak about this. Romans 16, 17 to 18, Paul says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. 2 Thessalonians 3.14 And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Swift a process. Titus 3.9-11 but avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they're unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man 
after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sin in being self-condemned. So someone comes into a church, they start spreading heresy, they start causing division. They can't say, I'll get away with this for months before you've gone through this process. It needs to be dealt with more swiftly. And these scriptures give us the precedent for doing that. They're to be noted, rejected, and avoided. But this is different to the excommunication that's the last stage of formal church discipline. Now, in regard to the practice of excommunication, you may have noticed Paul describes this in 1 Corinthians 5 as being delivered over to Satan. Quite strong words. And he says the same at the end of 1 Timothy chapter 1. But this really means that a person who gets to this point has allowed all of God's protective means by which believers are kept accountable and safe, such as the Word of God, the people of God, the local church, to be stripped from their life. And therefore, such a person is open game for Satan. But even then, God is in control and still gives them a final opportunity to truly repent. The last opportunity is really just the havoc that is wrought in their life where they're open game for Satan, rejecting all of God's means. So this leads us to the next part of the message, a very important part, and that is the why of church discipline. Now to summarize this simply, I'd describe the main reasons of why God requires a church to practice church discipline as follows. Number one, the restoration of the member in unrepentant sin and the prevention of that member suffering the consequences of continued sin. So the restoration of the member in unrepentant sin and the prevention of that member suffering the consequences of continued sin. Number two, the purity and protection of the church from the harmful effects of unrepentant sin in a church member's life. The purity and protection of the church from the harmful effects of unrepentant sin in a church member's life. Look at point one first. It's important to realize that what Jesus says in Matthew 18, 15 to 20 is in the context of what he previously said in verses 11 to 14. <clears throat> so have a look at verses 11 to 14 of Matthew 18. Jesus says, For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Directly after this parable, Jesus goes into speaking about correcting a brother in sin and the process of church discipline. So church discipline, again, is really a rescue mission at its core. It's a rescue mission. But even as a shepherd goes looking for the sheep that went astray, that animal will not always welcome the process. And as many of us know, when a shepherd has sheep that consistently go astray, He often has no choice but to break one of their legs for their own good to prevent them getting into the place where they won't be safe. The pain has a purpose. The seemingly harsh treatment is an act of courageous love. So it's always good for us to bear in mind that as difficult as it is to bring loving correction when required in the appropriate way is loving. It won't always be received that way, especially at first. Remember Proverbs 28, 23 I read last week. He who rebukes a man will find more favor afterward than he who flatters with a tongue. It takes time to sink in sometimes. You don't always get a good response initially. But we do have the encouragement also of James 5, 19 to 20. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. It's an encouragement to do what is required. Now the book of 2 Corinthians 
is often referred to by theologians as 3 Corinthians. And this is because the way it is written gives a strong indication that there was a previous letter, some things occurred, and the indication is given that after Paul wrote what he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that we read earlier, urging the believers to deal with the sin that they've been ignoring and gloating about, it appears that they did heed his words. They did carry out church discipline towards the man who is in an adulterous relationship with his stepmother. And it also appears that he responded with repentance. And so 2 Corinthians, or 3 Corinthians, as it's often called, we see Paul writing again, this time encouraging the believers to acknowledge his obvious repentance displayed in sorrow and affirm him again as a brother. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I'd like us to see this. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. <clears throat> Remember how serious it was? Remember how they were not dealing with it? They did deal with it. He did repent. 2 Corinthians 2, verses 3 to 8. And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy. Having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. But if anyone has caused grief, he's not grieved me, but all of you to some extent not to be too severe. This punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, see there? That's what they did that they weren't doing, is sufficient for such a man, so that, on the contrary, in other words, there's, there's clear repentance now, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. The person in name was obviously sorrowful over their sin. And this is, this is characteristic of genuine repentant people. You never have to remind them to repent a little bit more, but most of the time you do have to affirm to them, it is okay. You are forgiven. You're on the right track. Verse 8, therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. So we always need to have this goal of restoration in our minds and what a blessing it is when it happens. I shared with you last week of one of the few times we needed to do this at Redemption Church in Christchurch and as difficult as it was, praise God, it did lead to the repentance and restoration of a church member and the whole congregation were encouraged to embrace him back into fellowship. Having said this, sadly, it would appear to be consistently the case that the majority of the time, sadly, when church discipline is carried out, it doesn't result in restoration. It just, I, I've never really heard anything to contradict that from speaking to people. But the whole point is, we still need to rescue the sheep that we can get back. So looking at point two then, this is why it will be unbalanced, point two of the why, to say that the only goal is the restoration of the church member in sin. That will be unbalanced. Elders have a responsibility as under-shepherds to guard and protect the flock. When unrepentant sin is threatening to destroy a family, a marriage, or a church, the goal is not just restoration of the sinning church member, it is also the purity and protection of the church, of the wife who the husband has committed adultery, whatever the situation is, from harmful and potentially widespread effects of that sin. Now, we saw a couple of weeks ago in our study in Acts 5 how seriously God took the first incidents of unrepentant sin in the early church, the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Simply wasn't an option to allow their secret unrepentant sin to corrupt the witness of the church. Why? 1 Corinthians 5, 6. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. In the local church today, God has entrusted a stewardship of care to the elders in the local church with the assistance and cooperation of deacons and church members so the church's witness is not destroyed by sin and so that church members' lives are not devastated by sin. If you look back at Matthew 18, that's what verses 18 to 20 are speaking about. 
where it says, Assuredly, I say to you, Jesus speaking, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. As Jesus speaks of things being bound in heaven that are bound on earth, and things being loosed in heaven that are loosed on earth, he's referring to the authority that Christ has given the church. The church acts on behalf of Christ, in the authority of Christ, and from heaven Christ himself ratifies that which is carried out in accordance with his word. When the church does it right, This is sometimes referred to as the keys to the kingdom, as described by Jesus in Matthew 16 when he speaks to Peter. And in verse 19 of Matthew 18, Jesus says, when two people agree together on the issue of a sinning believer, because this is not a verse that says, just two of you agree on anything and God will do it like the genie in the sky. But when two people agree together on this issue, it will be backed up. The idea is if the sin of the member is bound or retained, it is bound in heaven. If the church considers it to be the unrepentant sin, Christ considers it to be unrepentant sin. If the sin of the member is loosed, speaking of forgiveness following repentance, again, this is mirrored in heaven. And Jesus then goes on to say, where two or three are gathered, he is there. Again, Christ is present in the midst of them. This is another great contender for the most misunderstood and misquoted verse, along with judge not that I spoke about last week. The context of this statement about two or three gathering is not an encouragement for tiny churches or tiny gatherings. It it can have some side application to that, of course. That's not the context. It's a reminder that even when there are two or three gathered, if the Lord's word is being honoured, if the means of grace are being facilitated, church discipline can still be carried out. That's the primary context of when two or three are gathered, church discipline. In other words, when there's only a handful of believers... They can't escape the purifying, protective measures put in place by the Lord to bring sinners to repentance and to guard the church, no matter how small it is. So there is actually a third point we can put under the why of church discipline, and that is the stewardship of authority and responsibility Christ has given to the local church through its elders requires them to practice church discipline whether they want to or not. And remember, most of the time, elders don't want to do this. They don't. But they do it because they acknowledge they're accountable to God and the church belongs to him, not to them. Okay, let's move on now and consider some of the hindrances to the effectiveness of church discipline. I'll keep things moving. I know this is a little bit longer. It's an important subject. You won't be disciplined if you have to leave early. Now, just because a church is willing to carry out church discipline, it doesn't always mean it will be effective, as I've said. There are a number of reasons for this. I'm just going to list the ones that we've already covered as we've looked at this so far, just so it's all in one place. I'm not going to comment on them, but then I'll mention a couple of others that we haven't really covered. So some of the hindrances to the effectiveness of church discipline, why does it not work as it should, would be not being willing to carry it out. That's pretty obvious. Lack of teaching, uninformed congregation, we've spoken about that. Bad, unbiblical experiences. Of course, a resistance to the correction or a refusal to repent. Not carrying out the informal measures, skipping stages, that would be a reason. Leaders, church members acting impatiently and or unlovingly. Unnecessary suspicion of leadership due to slander and gossip by the unrepentant church member. Poor or absent communication to the church from leaders, that's the key. Church members choosing indifference or apathy towards the church member's sin, where the whole church is not really on board. Or the unrepentant church member goes to another church who accepts them without challenging their sin. So we've we've really touched on all of these in some way. But here are a couple of others you need to bear in mind. Division within the congregation occurring before or developing during the process of church discipline. Of course, it's so much better if a church is experiencing unity before going through something like this. But if it isn't, 
or if division occurs during the process, it greatly weakens the essential unity required for church discipline to be effective. Church discipline, no matter how strong a church is, puts a church in an incredibly vulnerable situation. So we need to bear that in mind. Another one would be church members siding with the member in sin, and listen carefully, for the primary purpose of avoiding conflict, avoiding uncomfortable situations, or having an unbiblical idea of love and compassion. Now, when we face these situations, again, no one really wants to be a part of it, or they shouldn't. No one looks forward to jumping into the conflict or bringing correction to a fellow believer, and we want to think the best. But sometimes this can result in church members playing down what is going on in the name of love and compassion. And this can greatly undermine the process of church discipline. Please listen very carefully to this. When... The main reason they are doing it is to avoid being thought of badly or to avoid the uncomfortable nature of the conflict. In other words, that which everybody else has to deal with. But because they don't want to do that, then they compromise in the name of love or understanding, but it undermines the process. It's understandable, but it's not excusable. And I'll explain it this way. I touched on this a little last week. In a church discipline situation where correction is required, the more the weight of uncomfortableness can be spread among the members of the church, meaning they all take responsibility to lovingly urge the sinner to repent, the less weight each person has to carry. If we try too hard to still be the friend of the member in sin in a way that's not appropriate because we still want to be liked by them, then by default we basically maximize the animosity and resentment that person has towards those who are walking the uncomfortable path by bringing correction in love. I hope that makes sense. Another hindrance, the last one on that list is this. When communication is received, as confrontation and exhortation becomes irritation. Now, there's no doubt about it. Certain cultures and certain personalities struggle with this more than others. Some cultures can thrash things out with each other, and the next day, everyone is fine. If you witness the conversation, you'd think, oh, well, they're never going to speak to each other again. And they're like, hug, how you doing? Want a coffee? Sure. Other cultures find this more difficult, and I think here in New Zealand and back in the UK, where I'm from, we generally find it more difficult than perhaps our friends in the USA and Australia. I think it's just the way it is. Either way, culture must conform to biblical principles when there's a biblical reason for doing this. And this is all to say, I think we probably need to work extra hard in our culture here in New Zealand generally speaking, to develop an atmosphere in our churches and in our lives where we can give and receive loving correction without being too easily offended, without taking things too personally, and also when the correction that comes from God's word is consistent with God's word, we don't resent or reject the messenger of that word. Now, hopefully, I can get away with saying that now that I've been living in New Zealand for nearly 26 years. All our children have been born here. It's still happening. And we now have, <laughs> we now have citizenship at last. On the other hand, if you're too easily offended, then you're probably going to be offended by me suggesting that you are too easily offended. <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. Now, the purpose of listing these things here is that we could acknowledge there are so many factors that can interrupt and interfere with the process, so it should give us good reason to do all we can to make sure, firstly, it never needs to happen. Isn't that the number one goal? But when it does need to happen, we must carry it out carefully and prayerfully with much love and patience. Before we went into the COVID season in 2020, I spent a period of about eight months helping another pastor and his leadership in another part of New Zealand walk through a church discipline situation in regard to an extremely serious and prolonged sexual sin situation. And the toll that it took on the leaders and the church was colossal. 
It was messy, it was complicated. A lot of people left the church and it didn't even end in restoration. And those leaders and remaining members don't doubt at all that it was necessary. They don't regret carrying it out, but only recently has the church really said that it's back on its feet again, having been through this. So lastly then, we'll just conclude the study by looking at some of the consequences of not practicing church discipline. I'm really just going to read these out with very little comment. What are the potential or likely consequences for a church if they neglect to practice church discipline when it is biblically required? Here's a few to consider. Sin is free to spread like cancer within the lives of those who are part of the church. It's one of the consequences. Another, the testimony of the church is compromised, dishonoring the name of Christ. Marriages, families, and lives can be irreversibly destroyed by sin. Unnecessary division occurs within the church. And we also have the potential for God glorifying repentance and restoration being significantly reduced or removed altogether. And lastly, the power of the gospel is restrained and the truth of God's word is neglected. I'll just qualify that statement. The power of the gospel can never be restrained in that God will save who he will save. But we limit and hinder the way the gospel power is unleashed through such a process when we neglect God's word. And so I hope as we look at these things, we can see why it shouldn't be an option for us, difficult as it is, to neglect this practice when it is required. This is why it is a core value of our church, because when a person becomes a member here, they need to understand if we need to, we will practice church discipline but we hope we never need to. And if we need to, we hope that you will be on board with that also. Now, even within the context of parenting, this principle is understood and encouraged that if we avoid the difficult but necessary stuff just because it's difficult, we make things a lot more complicated and traumatic further down the line. If we choose the easy path, Proverbs 13, 24 says, He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly, early. Speaks of something that is taken care of as soon as it needs to be and as soon as it can be. And then lastly, Hebrews 12, 11, Now no chastening or discipline seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards. <laughs> There's a lot between the discipline often, and that word, isn't it, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to everyone? No. To those who have been trained by it. So it's a big subject to tackle. It's a big process to carry out, but when done right, it can lead to the peaceable fruit of righteousness. I'm happy to talk afterwards, as always, if you have any questions. But I hope as you've gone through this study again, it's helped to see God's heart of love and mercy, even through this practice of patient and loving church discipline. So let's pray together, and then Kevin's going to come and lead us in a time of communion. Thank you for your patience as well with this slightly longer message. Father, we thank you for your word that is sufficient for all things. And in this uh, difficult area of church discipline, your word proves sufficient too. And I pray you'd help us as a church, Lord, to continue to learn and understand what this means. We know this is not a two-session course where now we're all up to speed and ready to jump into it. May it not need to happen, Lord, here But if it does, may we have the strength to carry it out. But I do pray, Lord, that more importantly, in our church family, you would help us to develop this culture, even if it is counter-cultural, 
of loving one another enough to give and receive correction to your glory. And that we would have the humility to respond accordingly for the sake of your precious name and for the purity of your church. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.